Hi guys and welcome to Energy and Enzymes. I'm your host Liz Thomas and let's get going. Sorry, I know who I, I know you know who I am. I just wanted to make that joke. <laughs> so this is where we left off last time. We were talking about metabolic reactions. And remember a metabolic reaction or a metabolic pathway is a step by step process of taking one molecule such as let's say A over here and converting A into B. In order to convert A into B we need a specific enzyme for that particular step and that enzyme will do a particular reaction. Alright, and then the second step of a metabolic pathway will convert B to C using a second enzyme that may do a different reaction and then from C to D using a third enzyme that may do a different reaction. So you already know some examples of metabolic pathways, right? Cell respiration is actually a, a, very, a very long metabolic pathway. Photosynthesis is a long metabolic pathway. Lactic acid fermentation, where we produce lactic acid in our muscles, is a fairly short metabolic pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway. This is actually how we make ATP, NADH, and FADH2. This is how we make the physical molecules of ATP, NADH, and FADH2. It's through the pentose phosphate pathway. Right, fatty acid beta oxidation pathway is another pathway. Um, we are not going to worry too much about these quite yet, though. They're just examples for us now. So remember that we had two. We could split metabolic pathways into two types: catabolic pathways and anabolic pathways. And I have a little. Remember this: <laughs> catabolic pathways are where you break things down. All right, anabolic pathways are where you build molecules up. So let's take a look at a uh, at a catabolic pathway here. This pathway is actually, you guys may be familiar with it, this is actually glycolysis right here. And we feed in glucose in glycolysis and we get out as our first intermediate glucose 6-phosphate. We use a particular enzyme called the hexokinase or hexose kinase is another one of his other possible names. All right. And then we take glucose 6-phosphate, send it through another reaction using this heck of an enzyme, phosphoglucose isomerase, and we convert glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. So we have a unique enzyme that does each of these steps, and each of these will have it, uh, will have, we can actually categorize what kind of reaction it is, and we'll talk about our different reactions in just a bit. So this whole pathway over here on the right is represented in terms of its energy here in the graph on the left. So we start with glucose in the very beginning and notice that we end um, with pyruvate in glycolysis. So glycolysis right here we end with pyruvate but cell respiration doesn't end with you know with glycolysis we keep going we're gonna end up all the way down with this mouthful of a molecule's name oxaloacetate. So during glycolysis, what happens is we actually have to put a little bit of energy in, energy in. So this catabolic pathway at first requires a little bit of energy, and that's normal for catabolic pathways. In order to kind of get them kick-started, we've got to put some energy in. And then suddenly we get a big drop right there. This is where we get a lot of energy out. And then we get another drop right there, and another drop right there. We're getting lots and lots and lots of animated gifs of cats. <laughs> Lots of energy out here um, from our catabolic pathway. So catabolic pathways break molecules down allowing us to extract energy and extract electrons from the molecules that are being broken down. And yes, don't worry. We will go over this entire glycolysis pathway at some point. When I say some point, I mean very soon. Okay, so here's our four types of metabolic pathways that we can have. All right, so when I was referring back to this and I said, oh, this is one type of reaction right here, this is another type of reaction right here, All right, reaction one, reaction two, here are our four different types of reactions that we are going to study. Now, for our purposes, there's, we're only going to look at four types of reactions. There, there's, there's a few more, right? There's not 
actually that many more, but there are a few more. But there are literally thousands of different enzymes. All right, so every enzyme that does a reaction is unique, but we only have a few types of reactions, and they all follow the same basic behavior. The first reaction type that we, and we've already learned about this one, is hydrolysis and dehydration, also known as condensation. So remember, we use hydrolysis to break polymers apart. We use dehydration to link monomers together into a polymer. We've already learned about that one. We're not going to beat a dead horse here. All right. We're going to skip straight to the good stuff, straight to our other reaction types. Reduction oxidation reactions. A lot of times reduction oxidation is coupled together. It's called a redox reaction. Um, it's kind of like Brad and Angelina Jolie, right? Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, you call them Brangelina. Here it's just reduction oxidation. You squish them together and call them redox. And then we're going to look at exergonic and endergonic reactions, the most important of which is phosphorylation. Phosphorylation is a subcategory of exergonic and endergonic reactions. All right. And then we will look at isomerization reactions. Isomerization reactions. So one thing to note, you may have learned in chemistry class um, the terms exothermic and endothermic. Uh, for our purposes, we can treat, we can use exothermic and exergonic pretty much interchangeably, endothermic and endergonic pretty much interchangeably. Um, there is a slight difference in definition. Exergonic just means to release energy. Exothermic means to specifically release heat. But not something we need to worry about here. But in case you were wondering. Okay, so let's look at our, our second reaction type right here, reduction and oxidation reactions. All right. So in chemistry, maybe you learned this in chemistry. If you haven't yet, oh, you will. Don't worry. All right. So in chemistry, a reduction reaction is where you gain electrons. And a molecule that is reduced is gaining electrons. Um, and you probably might be going, wait, if you're gaining electrons, if you're adding electrons to a molecule, why, why are you reducing, right? Well, because electrons are negatively charged, they reduce the molecule's charge that they are added to. So we say that when you add electrons to a molecule, you're reducing the charge of the molecule, hence a reduction reaction. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, the loss of electrons, and in oxidation the molecules usually lose their electrons to oxygen. Remember oxygen is really electronegative, loves himself some electrons, so when a molecule is oxidized it's had electrons taken away, or the electrons, if they haven't been totally taken away, they've at least shifted in their bond away from the carbons in the molecule and towards any oxygens that are that are around it. All right, so here's the thing about redox reactions. They are always paired. If one molecule loses electrons, somebody else has to gain. It's like money, right? You can't just lose money. Somebody else is going to get it from you. Um, so that's why we squish the two terms together. We call it, we just call them redox reactions. And uh, one way to remember this is the term oil rig. Oil rig, oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining, and here, of course, we are referring to electrons. Okay, so this is where we start to diverge a little bit from chemistry class. All right, in biology, when molecules are reduced, not only do they gain electrons, they usually gain a hydrogen that comes along with the electrons. So here we are looking at just some, um, some example molecules down here. This right here is CH4. This right here is CH4. All right, I've just pulled out one carbon-hydrogen bond right there. Okay, so this carbon-hydrogen bond is reduced. This is a fairly reduced bond. This molecule right here is CH3OH. I'm just pulling out the COH bond for our inspection. All right. That COH bond right there is a little more oxidized than CH. If 
could go on down to C double bondo that is even more heavily oxidized than COH. A carbon that has a carboxyl group attached to it, a carboxyl group is a C double bondo OH, is even more heavily oxidized than a C double bondo. And then you get all the way down here to the carbon dioxide, the CO2, that is a very, very heavily oxidized molecule. So as you're moving from left to right here, as you're moving from our CH4 to our CO2, you're gaining an oxygen, you're losing hydrogen, you're being oxidized. But as you're moving from right to left in the opposite direction, you're gaining hydrogen, you're losing oxygen, therefore you're gaining electrons. Now one thing that's kind of interesting, um, because we, you know, oxygen obviously, we breathe it in, it's abundant in the air, um, oxygen does oxidation, right? Duh. <laughs> no shit Sherlock, right? So if oxygen does oxidation, it'll try and oxidize any molecules it comes in, into contact with. And a lot of molecules aren't really willing to give up their electrons very easily, but some do, right? Iron will give up its electrons quite easily, so oxygen will oxidize iron, and that's why iron rusts. Actually, the red rust is iron oxide. Um, this is also what happens when you op when when f a lot of food spoils too, like especially when um, oil goes rancid. Like, you ever open up a bottle of oil and you use a little bit of it and then you shove it in the back of your pantry, and then a couple months later you you find it again, you open it up and you smell it and it kind of smells nasty. Be that's actually because it's oxidized as a result of coming into contact with oxygen. Okay. So here's the thing about oxidation and reduction reactions, right? Um, we've, we will take food molecules and rip away the electrons from the food molecules. So we oxidize the food molecules. But when we rip those electrons away, we can't just like let those electrons go wander around our cells, right? Electrons, they're, they're kind of like little kids. If you let them go by themselves, they're going to make a mess, they're going to get lost, they're going to destroy things, they're going to scribble all over the walls, right? So we can't just let those electrons go free. We have to give those electrons to an electron carrier. Excuse me, sorry, just hiccuped. So these electron carriers act as a, a way to store those electrons and protect them and protect ourselves from the electrons. And our two electron carriers that our cells use the most often are NADH and FADH2. And actually, I shouldn't say that they are the most often. They are the ones that are used most often in catabolic pathways. Right, so NADH and FADH2 are used in catabolic pathways. We also have another electron carrier you may have heard of called NADPH. You probably heard of him in the context of photosynthesis before. Um, NADPH, I was about to write photosynthesis, NADPH is used for anabolic pathways, whereas NADH and FADH2 are used for catabolic pathways. We're mostly going to focus on cell respiration, so we're mostly going to be using NADH and FADH2 here though. All right, so those are the ones we'll look at from here on out in this lecture. So NADH and FADH2 are big long chemical names um, and these are two molecules that act as our electron carriers. They receive the electrons that we rip away from our food molecules and store the electrons temporarily. So NADH, notice it has the H right there, that means it has a hydrogen added, it's been reduced. All right. So at that point we've added the electrons to it, we've reduced that electron carrier. Now, once we want to use those electrons for something else, right, we're going to oxidize our NADH and turn our NADH into something called NAD+. It's plus because we've taken away its electrons, so we've taken away negative charges, it goes to plus. We say NAD plus is the oxidized form and NADH is the reduced form. FAD and FADH2 is our other major electron carrier and it goes through a similar pattern. FAD is the oxidized form down here. FADH2 is the reduced form. Um, during reduction, you add electrons. During oxidation, you take away electrons. 
And um, NADH is used way more often than FADH2. NADH can, can um, accept electrons from bonds that were very high energy, so very, NADH can accept very high energy electrons. FADH2 doesn't really accept very high energy electrons. So our cells really, really like NADH. They don't really use FADH2 so much, but we still keep it around for, you know, occasional uses. Now, where do NADH and FADH2 come from? Well, this is what they look like. And don't panic quite yet. Okay, not yet anyways. This structure is very, very familiar to us. And to give you a little bit of background information, FAD actually comes from riboflavin, which is vitamin B2. NAD is derived from ni niacin, which is vitamin B3. So if you ever look at your nutrition facts labels, like on the back of a cereal box or something, I always did this as a kid. You know, I'd get really bored and I'd turn around the, the, the side of the cereal box and read the nutrition facts. I was a weird kid. And I always saw these names like niacin and riboflavin and vitamin B6 and vitamin B12 and B2 and B3 and I had no idea what they meant until I got to biology and I went, oh, now I know. Well, now you know too. We need these vitamins in order to create our electron carriers so we can do redox reactions in our cells. So now we know where they come from. Where do they hang out in our cells? These electron carriers are everywhere. They're in the cytoplasm. They're in the mitochondria. They're... I actually don't know if they're in the nucleus. They might be. I'll have to think about that. But they're found everywhere a redox reaction is done, which is everywhere inside the cell. And they're just floating around in the cytoplasm. And when we look at the names, let's look at FAD first. Flavin adenine dinucleotide. We recognize part of the names, well, the adenine, right? That's from, well, like ATP in the A in DNA and RNA. Di for two nucleotide. Remember, there's three components of a nucleotide. There's the five carbon sugar. Uh, there's the phosphate group. And then there's the nitrogenous base, of which we have five possibilities. Well, let's look at the structure of FAD. All right, and here we have the oxidized form of FAD. We haven't added electrons to it yet. Here's the 5-carbon sugar, ribose, nitrogenous base, adenine. We have two phosphate groups instead of one, right? But there's a nucleotide right there. Now, we don't just have one nucleotide. We have a dinucleotide. So if we look right here, this is actually a sugar right there. This is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5-carbon sugar. It's just in a li linear form instead of a ring form. Here's our nitrogenous base, a huge monster up there that's actually called flavin. Right, that's where the flavin comes from. And down there, that was our phosphate group. So, dinucleotide. There's two nucleotides joined together end to end. When we add electrons to FAD, then, we add it on right here and right here. So, we, uh, for reasons we won't really get into, we add on two hydrogens. And remember, hydrogens come with electrons. Now, when we look at NAD+, on the other hand, look, dinucleotide thing going on again, adenine, nicotinamide. So, here's our 5-carbon sugar, adenine, phosphate group of one nucleotide. Here's our 5-carbon sugar, phosphate group, a nitrogenous base of the second nucleotide, you stick them together, you get NAD+. And with NAD+, we just add on one hydrogen to get NADH. Now, what's interesting, those of you guys who are in organic chemistry, this will be very cool to you. Those of you guys who are not in organic chemistry, this will be very confusing to you. Feel free to ignore what I'm about to say. All right. So for these electron carriers in their oxidized forms, um, they're actually non-aromatic. So 
they don't have those overlapping p orbitals that you need to be aromatic um, they're quite unstable as soon as you reduce them though you add in um, you add in aromaticity right you make you add in more possible resonant structures you create overlapping p orbitals a reduced form of these electron carriers is very very stable so just a little tidbit kind of interesting there okay so when do we use these electron carriers and um, here's an example so right here this molecule that we see this guy keep in mind that the way he's written is a bit of a shorthand way so there is a CH3 right here and there is a CH3 right there there's a carbon right there okay so this is a three carbon molecule this one down here there's a carbon right there there's a CH3 right there and uh, I kinda lost a CH3 when I was constructing this I'm going to pretend there's a CH3 right there <laughs> okay you just kinda have to bear with me I'm sorry so what we do here is we take this molecule and we oxidize it. We stir up away some electrons. All right. And if we remember our oxidation ladder that we saw before, we had CH first. We said that was the most reduced bond. And COH and C double bond O and C double bond O, OH, and then finally CO2 at the very end. So right now, with this molecule we have a C double bond O when we oxidize it we're going to go one step down our ladder we're going to go to the right and we're going to create a C double bond O OH and that's what I tried and failed to do down here but hopefully you get the idea so we can tell that an oxidation reaction has taken place because of how our structure has changed and by the fact that we've gone one step to the right on the oxidation ladder so because we've oxidized we have to reduce, right? These reactions are always coupled. We're going to take those electrons that we've stripped away, we're going to transfer them to our electron carriers. And at this point, we can't predict which electron carrier we will use. Right? That's something for biochemistry. I want to know if you guys take it. Um, just know that we will give it to our one of our one of our two possible electron carriers, either NAD plus or FAD, and reduce them into NADH and FADH2. Alright, so here's a cool reaction. Here's a really, really cool example. So let's take ethanol. Ethanol, our favorite molecule, also known as alcohol. And keep in mind with this molecule, there is a CH3 right there. There's a CH2 right there. When we drink booze, right, when we drink booze, that alcohol will travel to our liver and meet up with an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And right away, the name dehydrogenase should kind of give you an idea of what this guy does. D means to remove Hydro hydrogen, right? Well, he's removing a hydrogen. If he's removing a hydrogen, he's also removing electrons. He is oxidizing. So the enzymes that often do oxidation reactions are called dehydrogenases. They also may come under the name oxidoreductases. Oxidoreductases or dehydrogenases are the two main enzymes that do um, redox reactions. And while well, not completely necessary for this class, this is very, very, very important to know for a lot of standardized tests. Okay, so we're going to oxidize this, this alcohol molecule, right? So we're going from our COH on the oxidation ladder. The next step to the right is a C double bond O. And here we go. We got a C double bond O right there. Because we are oxidizing, we have to be reducing. So we're going to bring in one of our electron carriers. And in this case, it's going to be NAD+. Plus we're going to reduce him to NADH. All right. So this is actually the first step in breaking down alcohol using the enzymes in your liver. And this is down here. Hold on one sec. Ugh. 
Sorry, I got my hair caught in the thing behind me and it hurt. <laughs> there we go. Got myself free there. Um, this enzyme down here, that's alcohol dehydrogenase in all of his glory. Now what's really kind of cool about this, this is not something you need to know, but it's neat. This molecule right here, acetaldehyde, that we made from alcohol, it's further converted into acetic acid. So acetic acid looks like that. So we're just going another step on the oxidation ladder, getting another NADH out of the deal. Um, and the enzyme that does this reaction from acetaldehyde to acetic acid is called acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. I tell you about that name, right? Dehydrogenase name. Um, and this enzyme is actually slightly defective in many Asian populations. Um, and the defective allele that or gene that contributes to this is actually believed to originate with the Han Chinese. So if you have Han Chinese heritage, there's a good chance that your acetaldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme doesn't work particularly efficiently, which means that acetaldehyde tends to build up in your bloodstream because you don't break it down very rapidly. Um, and while this doesn't really have any bad effects, it can turn, uh, it, it does make blood vessels in your peripheral skin dilate pretty drastically. Um, so you get red faced very, very easily as a result of drinking. So this is the, uh, this, there's a biological reason, but reason behind that Asian glow, right? And this is it. Didn't think you learned about that in a discussion about enzymes, huh? <laughs> so let's go on to our next major type of reaction, exergonic and endergonic reactions. So just a quick primer, an exergonic reaction is a reaction that releases energy. X means former. So think about it from the point of view of molecules. They're releasing the energy. They no longer have the energy. An endergonic reaction, endo means inside, an endergonic reaction absorbs energy. So an exergonic reaction can be accompanied by the, um, can be accompanied by oxidation. So you can not only lose energy, you can also lose electrons. Same thing with an endergonic reaction. You can not only gain energy, you can also gain electrons, or you can just uh, or you can just gain energy without the electrons. Or you can just gain electrons without the energy. So many times these overlap, these reactions. So when we look at the energy within a molecule and, and as it undergoes an exergonic or endergonic reaction, here's what the graphs of those reactions look like. So up here, we're going to start with an exergonic reaction. Um, let's actually start with, hmm, Let's start with glucose, our favorite molecule. No, our favorite molecule is alcohol. Glucose is our, no, glucose is our third favorite molecule. Second favorite molecule is sucrose. Anyways, <laughs> we're going to take glucose and we're, and we're going to send it through cell respiration, which is technically not a single reaction, but right here for our example, this works. We're going to oxidize it all the way down to carbon dioxide. So we're putting in glucose, we're getting out carbon dioxide. Glucose has lots of chemical potential energy, right? Lots of carbon hydrogen, lots of carbon hydroxyl or carbon OH bonds. And when we extract the energy from glucose, we are also extracting electrons too. Its, it's, uh, it's chemical potential energy falls. So we see this graph sloping downwards. And by the way, this is the delta G, the Gibbs free energy, if you know what that is. Okay. Here's the thing about doing this though, about releasing the energy from food molecules like glucose. This doesn't just happen all by itself, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, let me draw like a hill here. That's a crappy looking hill, but you get the idea. Let me draw a ball on the top of the hill. When we have a ball on the top of the hill, it won't just spontaneously roll down the hill, right? We have to give it a little push. So with an exergonic reaction, even though it would release a lot of energy, it would release electrons to, that we could pull away, you'd think it'd be a good thing, it won't necessarily spontaneously happen. 
we have to get over this little bump here. And this little bump is called the activation energy, also known as the energy of activation, All right, in order to get this reaction going. And a lot of times, it's actually enzymes that supply this activation energy, or even better, if those enzymes are really good, they will actually lower the activation energy on me drawing isn't quite working out here. Come on, pen, let's do this. There we go. There we go. All right. So enzymes will lower this activation energy or they'll supply any energy that you may need. The opposite of this is an endergonic reaction. This is where you start with molecules that are very low energy. You feed lots of energy. You may feed electrons into them. All right. So let's actually take do the opposite here. Take CO2 and turn it into glucose. So we have to climb up a huge hill in order to do this. We also have activation energy there too. All right, But this activation energy spans the entire length from the, from the energy of the reactants, of that carbon dioxide that went in, all, all the way to the top of this bump. And the reason why we have a bump here at the very top, by the way, oops, is because I'm really bad about keeping this in place. There we go. Um, the reason why we have a bump at the top here um, is, well, let me give you an analogy for this. Imagine that you're running really, really, really fast, right, as fast as you can, and somebody tells you to stop. Well, you can't just stop immediately, right? You can't stop on a dime. It, you're going to take a couple steps to come to a stop, and that's kind of what happens with a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction doesn't just come to a halt as soon as it's done. It's still going to go for, it's, it's going to overshoot a little bit. So that's what's happening here is we're overshooting just by a little bit before we settle back down into our products. And in this case, right here, in order to climb up this giant hill of energy, not only do we need an enzyme, we also need an outside power source, usually in the form of ATP. And you guys have probably heard about this molecule, ATP. We will discuss a lot more about him in just a little bit. Okay. So a phosphorylation reaction is a really, really special type of endergonic and exergonic reaction. Um, and let me give you a little bit of background here on phosphorylation reactions before we jump into how, why it's special. A phosphorylation reaction is the addition of a phosphate group to a molecule. We can phosphorylate anything. We can phosphorylate proteins. We can phosphorylate glucose. We can phosphorylate um, DNA and RNA and all that stuff. Any molecule that we have, we can phosphorylate. And phosphorylation is simply, again, adding a phosphate group. Now, when we add a phosphate group, though, we are creating a chemical bond. We're creating a covalent bond. So let's look at this example down here. Okay, Here I'm taking a molecule. This is actually acetic acid. This is vinegar right here. That's acetic acid. Remember, there's a carbon here and a carbon at the end here. When we phosphorylate this molecule, usually we phosphorylate wherever there's an oxygen right there. We are creating this chemical bond right here. There's lots of chemical potential energy in that bond. So in order to do a phosphorylation reaction, we have to put in energy. A phosphorylation reaction is therefore endergonic. So a phosphorylation reaction is endergonic. Okay? So one of the neat things that we can do is whenever we have plenty of energy floating around, we can take a phosphate group, stick it on some nearby molecules, and we've stored our excess energy by doing that. So we don't just let that energy go to waste, right? We can use that energy to phosphorylate other molecules and store that, that energy as chemical potential energy in the bonds of phosphate groups. So when we look at, the point, look at it from the point of view of a molecule, phosphorylation reactions actually increase a molecule's chemical potential energy. 
Now, the molecule that we phosphorylate the most is ATP. All right. So ATP is the main chemical potential energy storage molecule in our cells. ATP, remember, it stands for adenosine triphosphate. All right. So it's a nucleotide. It has that five. Oh, I circled the nitrogenous base. It has a nitrogenous base. It has the five carbon sugar ribose, and it has between one and three phosphate groups. Now you should be looking at those phosphate groups and you should be thinking lots of chemical potential energy in those phosphate groups. So what we can do is we can have a, this molecule with just one phosphate group. In that case, it would be called AMP. The M stands for mono. We can have ADP with two phosphate groups. We can go for the whole hog and we can have ATP with three phosphate groups. The more phosphate groups, the more chemical potential energy. So every time we phosphorylate this molecule, we are depositing energy, we're storing energy. So it's kind of like how a bank account stores money by having money deposited. We deposit chemical potential energy here. And ATP is for very, very short term chemical, uh, is for very, very short term energy use. Right? You'll use up all of the ATP in your cells within a couple seconds under intense exercise. Okay, so we just said that you use up ATP, right? Well, when you use up ATP, you're not actually breaking down the entire structure of the ATP molecule. You're just popping off one of those phosphate groups. The rest of the ATP molecule, the nitrogenous base, the five carbon sugar and, the, and sometimes even up to two phosphate groups still remain behind. All right? So ATP has three phosphate groups. It's ready to go. We can use it. We can pop off one of those phosphate groups and get ADP and release a bunch of energy in the process. That energy we can then use for cellular work, you know, for active transport and things like that. ADP has only two phosphate groups. It has less chemical potential energy, but we can still use it in some cases. AMP, on the other hand, we don't use very often as an energy storage molecule, right? We actually use it in RNA. AMP is the, nu is the A nucleotide in RNA, but it's really too low energy to be used for energy storage. Now you may be wondering, do we use molecules like GTP and CTP and TTP and all those for energy storage as well? And the answer is kind of, sort of, yes. We actually do use GTP quite a lot. CTP, TTP, UTP, not so much. And I don't really know the reason why. We, our cells really seem to prefer using ATP over anything else. So, here's what happens when we go through this ATP ADP cycle we start out with ADP less chemical potential energy we phosphorylate that ADP and it becomes ATP that's more chemical potential energy and that phosphorylation is endergonic it requires energy to do it Oop. All right. and then we take ATP We'll use it for, you know, whatever we need to use it for, for signal transduction, for active transport, right, for protein shape change. We will, we will pop off one of those phosphate groups, and when we pop off a phosphate group, we have a special name for it. We don't call it dephosphorylation. No, that would make too much sense. We call it hydrolysis. And if you're asking, was well, that because it involves water? You'd be correct. So... When we remove a phosphate group, we hydrolyze off a phosphate group, which removes that phosphate and releases energy. So that's actually going to be exergonic. Okay. So this process of storing ATP, building ATP from ADP, building ATP, building ATP, and then using it for cellular work, this is called energy coupling. All right. So 
make sure you're paying attention here, okay? This is a little complicated. Let's take glucose. Glucose is a really, really good source of energy. And let's catabolize that glucose into carbon dioxide. We're going to rip away tons of energy and tons of electrons. What really we're really going to focus on here is actually the energy. So this is going to be an exergonic reaction right here. Or rather, a series of exergonic reactions, but we'll just simplify it down to one. We're going to use the energy of that exergonic reaction to take low energy ATP, poor low energy ATP, and build that, did I say ATP? I meant ADP, and build that ADP up into ATP. ATP. And that buildup of ADP into ATP, of course, is endergonic. So we're using an exergonic reaction, the release of energy, to derive an endergonic reaction. Now we're going to use that ATP for stuff. We'll talk about what stuff that is in just a sec. So we're going to hydrolyze that ATP back into ADP. That hydrolysis will release energy. So that is going to be exergonic. And then cellular work, such as changing the shape of proteins, right? That's going to require energy. So I'm going to take a protein here, I'm going to say protein to changed protein. The little triangle sign is delta, it means change, all right, changed protein. In order to change a protein shape, that is actually an endergonic reaction. We need to add energy in order to make that protein change its shape. And this flipping back and forth from exergonic to endergonic to exergonic to endergonic using the intermediary of ATP this is called energy coupling all right so chemical potential energy is used is released from one reaction it's used to drive another reaction which is then used to drive another reaction which is then used to drive another reaction and by the way every single time this exergonic reaction happens remember not only, you're only going to be able to capture a fraction of the original energy released. So, going back to glucose being broken down into carbon dioxide, of that exergonic reaction of glucose being broken down into carbon dioxide, only about 30% of it, let me actually draw the arrow going the opposite way, only about 30% of it will get transferred over into forming ATP. The other 70% or so is going to be released as body heat. Remember, second law of thermodynamics. So here's a, here's a specific single example. Over here, this is more of a general overview. Here's a specific single example of energy coupling. We're going to take glucose again. We really, really like glucose here. And we're going to make glucose 6 phosphate out of him. Now I know you're going, wait a second, wait a second, we talked about ATP and phosphorylation and all that, now you're throwing glucose at me. Yeah, remember, we can phosphorylate any molecule, not just ADP into ATP, we can also phosphorylate glucose too. We won't talk about why here, you gotta wait until cell respiration as to why we do that to glucose. Um, quick little background bit of info though, again here's our glucose molecule. You are probably very familiar with him at this point. All right, draw on my glucose here. When we take a glucose molecule and we phosphorylate them, we actually add the phosphate group onto the sixth carbon. So I'm adding the phosphate group onto carbon number six. Carbon number one was right here. Two, 
three, four, five, six. Okay, so that's why this is called glucose six phosphate, because I'm phosphorylating the six carbon. Okay. So the enzyme that does this phosphorylation reaction, he has a name. His name is hexokinase. Recognize that kinase name? You should. Remember, kinases are the name of any enzymes that add phosphate groups. Remember that from signal transduction? Of course you don't. That's okay. All right. So kinases are the names of any enzymes that add phosph that that I should say transfer phosphate groups. Now the reason why we have hexo in front of that, well hex means six, right? And that hexo um, is actually referring to the six carbon glucose. Now in order to do this, in order to convert glucose into glucose six phosphate, right? We got to take Glucose, which is, relatively speaking, pretty low energy, so I'm looking at this graph down here in the lower left-hand corner. I'm going to add a phosphate group, therefore I'm going to add chemical potential energy to that glucose to turn it into glucose 6-phosphate. This is an endergonic reaction. So it's an endergonic reaction. Here I have endothermic, but it's endergonic. Specifically, it's phosphorylation. In order to power this, I need two things. I need an enzyme, that hexokinase, and I also need ATP. So ATP is going to be used, and it's actually hexokinase that's going to coordinate all of this. ATP is going to be used, it's going to be hydrolyzed. It's going to release its energy in an exergonic or exothermic reaction to produce ADP. The PI right here just stands for inorganic phosphate. It just means a phosphate group that's been detached from ATP. All right, so it's no longer attached to carbon. So when we do that hydrolysis reaction, we release energy. We can use that energy to f and feed it into glucose to produce glucose 6-phosphate. Now, we also do one other interesting thing here, and we're going to see this a little bit later as well. We take that phosphate group that formerly belonged to ATP, we're actually going to stick it onto glucose. So not only are we feeding in energy into this process, so not only are we taking away phosphate group uh, uh, energy from ATP, we're also taking away its phosphate group too. And we're giving both energy and the phosphate group to glucose to make glucose 6-phosphate. And in some cases, you're just going to transfer energy. In some cases, you're going to transfer both energy and a phosphate group. And in some very rare cases, you're going to transfer just the phosphate group. But those are, those are few and far between. So this is a specific energy coupling example. This is actually, if we go all the way back, this is actually the very, very, very first reaction in glycolysis. This is not worth going back that far. Oh, hold on. I want to see the cat. There we go. So this is the very first reaction in glycolysis, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, done by hexose kinase or hexokinase. All right, now we go through the long journey back through the slides. I feel like I should be whistling. You don't want to hear me whistle. Okay. <laughs> now we're back to the new stuff. So that's just one example of how we can use ATP. However, here is the major way we use ATP. We use ATP to change the shape of proteins. We change the shape of proteins. That is the major function of ATP is to change the shape of proteins. And because we're changing the shape of proteins using ATP, we're changing the function of ATP. And by the way, this I can almost guarantee you this will show up as a test or a quiz question. What is the main function of ATP? What is it called when you change protein shape? What's that reaction? It's a phosphorylation reaction. All right. Main function of ATP is to phosphorylate proteins to change the shape of the proteins. Okay. So here's an example. 
Here's a pump protein. Remember, pump proteins do active transport. Let me draw a cell membrane in the background there. So a pump protein will take maybe an ion or something and move it from one side of the cell membrane to the other. And here's a pump mem membrane protein that is closed. As soon as we take ATP and hydrolyze it into ADP in that inorganic phosphate, we can use the energy released by that hydrolysis to change the shape of the protein and open it up. And in this case, we're also going to be using the phosphate group, taking the phosphate group, sticking it on to the pump protein, and that helps the protein change shape. Remember, if you have a phosphate group, phosphate group is big, lots of electrons, very electronegative. It's going to mess with all of those delicate bonds in the protein, and it'll change the protein shape. Okay, our last type of chemical reaction, isomerization. All right, isomerization. This one's the easiest, thank goodness, right? In an isomerization reaction, an enzyme can flip around and rearrange chemical bonds. You're not really adding energy, you're not taking energy away, you're not adding electrons, you're not taking uh, electrons away, you're just rearranging things. All right. In chemistry, an isomer is, the, is a molecule that has the same number and type of atoms as another molecule, but a different arrangement. So here's an example. We are taking fructose 6-phosphate and converting it into glucose 6-phosphate through an isomerization reaction. This is actually one of the next steps in the glycolysis pathway, if you go all the way back and look at that. The name of the enzyme that does this is phosphoglucose isomerase. Look at that. It's in the name, isomerase. So both fructose 6-phosphate and glucose 6-phosphate are isomers of each other. Notice, by the way, this is unrelated, but look at that phosphate group, both on carbon number 6. Okay, so to summarize, we've looked at three new reactions today. Redox, exergonic, endergonic, with phosphorylation being the, the special version, and then isomerization reactions. So in redox reactions are two major accessory molecules, or NADH and FADH2, they're used to store electrons. In phosphorylation reactions, ATP is our major accessory molecule. It's used to store chemical potential energy. And we do that by adding a phosphate group. And again, the major job of ATP is to change protein shape. And then isomerization can rearrange a molecule. So another enzyme can use that molecule. Okay, so let's, oh, I had glycolysis right here, oh my god, okay. This is glycolysis, okay, this is the very, very first step of breaking down glucose, glycolysis. So we take glucose, break it down into glucose 6-phosphate. Because we are adding energy onto glucose, this is an endergonic reaction. Now in order to power the endergonic reaction, we need to take ATP and hydrolyze it to ADP. So from the point of view of ATP, it's actually an exergonic reaction, but we usually focus on the bigger molecules here, um, namely the glucose, the things that are being transformed. The enzyme that does this is our buddy hexokinase or hexose kinase, whatever you want to call them. In the next step, we take glucose 6-phosphate and rearrange it into fructose 6-phosphate. That's an isomerization reaction. We're going to take fructose 6-phosphate, add another phosphate group. So you see this by, this is 1, 6. It means there's two phosphate groups now. We've added a phosphate group. Therefore, we've added chemical potential energy. This is an endergonic reaction then. In order to power this, we take ATP and hydrolyze it to ADP. This reaction in brown right here, we actually haven't covered. This is one of the reactions that we don't, um, that we didn't look at. You'll learn that in biochemistry. Right here, from this molecule GLAP, glyceraldehyde, 3-phosphate, 
That's what it stands for. It involves NAD plus and NADH, so you know it's a redox reaction. And you can be able to tell it's a redox reaction not only because of the involvement of NADH, but if it gave you the structure of GLAP and the next molecule, you could look at the structure and say, oh, it moved to the right or it moved to the left on the oxidation ladder. I know it's a redox reaction. So we're not going to worry about it yet, but you can actually go through almost every single, every single reaction in this pathway, and you can categorize it now. Just think, you couldn't do that an hour ago. It's pretty cool, huh? So what this ultimately results in is a molecule called pyruvate that is way lower energy than glucose. We've extracted energy from glucose, and we've also extracted electrons from glucose in that redox reaction. This is a catabolic pathway. And this is actually one of the simpler catabolic pathways. I know you guys are looking at it going, no way in hell that's simple, but I promise it is one of the simpler catabolic pathways. So, <laughs> don't panic, you don't have to know this. Right, at least not yet, not in this class. What we looked at right here, glycolysis is right there this central line. Every single little dot is an intermediate, so we start with glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, etc., etc. This guy down here at the bottom, actually it's not that guy, it's this guy, that's pyruvate. So glycolysis forms the backbone of most of the rest of the cell's metabolism. So from all of the intermediates in glycolysis, look, you can feed out and you can do you can make all of your nucleotides you can make all of your lipids from the this is the TCA cycle down here also known as the Krebs cycle you can make all of your amino acids from the pieces of the Krebs cycle right you can get more exotic in your energy metabolism based on the products of the Krebs cycle so this combination of glycolysis the Krebs cycle and pyruvate oxidation which we will be looking at during cell respiration is the backbone for this cell's metabolism. Your cell can take a molecule of glucose and turn it into almost anything it needs. Similarly, your cell can take almost any molecule and turn it into glucose. That's why in cell respiration we start with glucose. It's the, it's the alpha and omega of building molecules and breaking molecules down. Okay, so that big long line that we saw, we have a name for that line for glycolysis and the processes that follow after it, namely the citric acid cycle and pyruvate oxidation and the electron transport chain. It's called central metabolism. All right, central metabolism. And central using central metabolism, again, we can build almost every molecule the cell needs. And, you know, some molecules are easier to build than others, right? Those that are a little harder to build, we really like to eat them, right? So our vitamins, right, vitamins B2 and B3 or NADH and, and FADH2, we really like to eat those if we can instead of going to all the trouble of building them. But, you know, we can mostly survive without them. But ions like magnesium, sodium, potassium, etc., we can't build those, right? We can't do fusion or fission. We have to consume those for sure. Now, using central metabolism, not only can we build any molecule or break down any molecule, we can use central metabolism to convert sugars, such as glucose, into ATP. In fact, that's kind of one of the side jobs of central metabolism. I know in Bio160, we really, really, really emphasized cell respiration, breaking down glucose, breaking down glucose, but arguably, it's more important for us to turn glucose into all, all of these other molecules that the cell needs. Now, all these other molecules that we generate during metabolism are called metabolites. Right, metabolites. So pyruvate, maybe you've heard of acetyl-CoA, glucose 6-phosphate, all of these are metabolites. If you want to get really specific, molecules made during catabolic pathways are actually called catabolites. So again, central metabolism is 
glycolysis and the TCA cycle. Some people also include the electron transport chain. And from that central metabolic pathway, you can build and break down almost anything. Okay, this is a very, very scary version of, um, of glycolysis right here. Right here, this is glycolysis. Okay, this part right here. This is the buildup of and breakdown of nucleotides. This is the TCA cycle. So some people will actually include the buildup and breakdown of nucleotides as part of central metabolism. But notice, glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, all right, acetyl-CoA, pyruvate. We got some ADPs and ATPs in here, all right. From our pyruvate, we can make lots of amino acids. That's what these are, amino acids. From our TCA cycle, we can also make lots of amino acids. So this is, you don't have to know anything on here um, right now. This is just to emphasize that it's all linked together. Okay, so I'm going to call it a day here. I have a feeling we are brain dead. I don't know about you guys, but I sure am. That was a little bit of a heavy duty lecture, but hopefully interesting. Um, as always, thank you for sticking with me, guys. And I'll see you, uh, see you with the next part.